Greetings, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to address all of you and welcome you to this uh, spectacular uh, Active Learning Workshop series event today. I'm Kanika Radhakrishnan, Program Director of Thai Women Global. Let me start off by giving you a quick uh, background on Thai Women. Thai Women, as most of you know, is a Thai global initiative and was launched in 2019. 2020 was our uh, debut year, and uh, we managed to onboard about 26 chapters worldwide and conducted our flagship pitch competition, which culminated in a grand finale in Dubai. 26 finalists from different chapters had participated in the grand finale, and uh, at the end of it, three superb women-led companies walked away with prizes in the amounts of $100,000, $25,000, and $10,000, respectively. This year, under the leadership of our two co-chairs, Dharti Arvind Desai and Smita Siddhanti, we are poised to touch even greater highs. With the over 46 chapters um, onboarded already to Thai women, and representing as many as 26 countries, we are pretty sure that we'll be doing bigger and better things this year at the Thai Women Finale in Dubai. Our flagship pitch competition is well underway and uh, the winners are all poised to present their grand pitches at the Jitex Future Stars in the third week of October. In addition to the flagship pitch competition, we've also launched two additional pillars this year that include the active learning workshop and uh, the, connect, uh, the open mic nights. Connect series was a pillar that was launched last year and was also going gung ho. Tonight, we bring you a session on digital marketing, and uh, this is um, moderated by Shabana Karim, who is a charter member of uh, Thai Dubai, and she's also on the executive committee of, uh, um, of Thai Women. And uh, let me give you a quick introduction on uh, Shabana before I pass it on to her to introduce our uh, panelist. Uh, Shabana is the owner and founder of the House of N Spa. And uh, over the years, Shabana's positive impact on the beauty industry in the UAE has been recognized through numerous awards, including three times winner of uh, Viva Magazine's Best Nail Bar, and uh, her company was also nominated as the best uh, salon of the region by SE. In uh, 2010, Shabana was recognized by the Dubai Quality Group as Businesswoman of the Year. The award-winning House of N Spa Collection operates 20 spas and salons comprising 20,000 square feet retail and operating space and employs more than 450 members of staff each dedicated to offering a flawless, consistent, and holistic customer experience. Over to you, Shabana, to introduce Ramit and uh, kickstart our session for today. Thank you. Thank you, Kanika. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, this very interesting, and I'm sure you'll find it very, very useful, inspiring evening by Ramit. Um, Ramit currently heads a Beta in the Middle East, a retail as a service company from Silicon Valley, expanding their footprint in the region with the Shalhoub Group. Beta's mission is to make retail accessible for all by building a new type of retail store. In the past few months, Beta has evolved their model and become a go-to platform for startups and innovators to seamlessly launch in the Middle East. Pri um, sorry, I'll just skip that. Ramit is well known in the Middle East's technical technology and retail industry for his experience and expertise in managing multi-million dollar projects. Commercial implementation of revolutionary experiences around mixed reality and mobility working with government bodies towards creating new ecosystems and building CXO level relationships to name a few. I mean, I can go on and on, but I'll stop there and, and, and you know, pass it over to Ramit. Um, what I would like to suggest is that um, as you, um, while Ramit is speaking, as you see questions coming up, please type in the Q&A and Ramit will be happy to uh, engage with you during his presentation to take those questions. Over to you, Ramit. Thank you, Shabana. And uh, thank you, Dharti, Kanika, and the entire Thai Women team. Uh, I'm so happy to be 
um, here today and presenting to everyone. And uh, it's truly my pleasure to do this. Uh, and the topic that we have today is, is very close to me because this is something um, I think you briefly mentioned it, Shivana. I've been doing this for a while in the region. And I personally find it very exciting to be talking about marketing and specifically digital marketing in general. Um, it's, a, it's a very, I would say it's a top trending topic in, in the marketing world. Everybody is trying to understand uh, what is uh, what is digital marketing or what is social media marketing and there's a lot of confusion so uh, I, I'm like I said I'm very happy to be talking about that um, so you uh, thank you for the introduction by the way that was that was great but then one thing I just want to expand upon um, aside from beta and uh, what I do right now with Shalu group and beta uh, and previously I was working with HTC and and I was leading the the smartphone uh, team and, and the virtual reality team. I was a vice president for Middle East and Africa. Um, so long story short, I, what, what I really, uh, I think uh, the, the area that I've always been exposed to is, is consumer electronics, uh, digital, let's say, uh, products, uh, hardware, software. It's been an exciting journey. And uh, in both my positions, I've been overseeing sales and marketing. And I think, uh, I think that that's, that's, evolved quite a bit, as you might might imagine in the last 15 years. So I'm more than happy to share my insights today. The way, I've con the way I want to conduct this session is uh, I've prepared a few slides earlier this week, and um, I just want to take you through them. I promise you I'm not trying to make this very theoretical. I, I, I don't think there's any value in that. Uh, what I want to do actually is show you some practical examples of how we've done things, uh, not just in my previous job or my present job, but more importantly, in terms of case studies, um, also, we've done something for Thai. I want to talk about that. But then I genuinely encourage participation. This is not a one-way lecture of any by any means. Uh, it's not. It's not. It's not that. So feel free to please uh, type in your questions and your comments. I'm more than happy to address them as we go along uh, the session or or towards the end, whatever suits you. So, I mean, my I'm just looking at my notes, and I'm going to do that because it's quite quite a bit to cover today. Uh, so the main aim for the session is, is to introduce digital marketing and, and talk about the top trends. Um, it, as you might imagine, this is a huge universe of different platforms, um, different types of marketing, different sorts of channels, audiences, targeting. So we're not going to make it complicated. And it's assuming that there are different types of industries here, uh, I mean, in terms, in terms of attendees and the different uh, folks here, maybe who have different objectives in the businesses or in their lives. So I'm going to try and make it very generic. I don't want to focus on one area and dive into it too much and make it technical. So I hope I hope I can add value on that front. Um, I will use fairly simple language. I don't want to use too many jargons because I, then it gets confusing. So I think if there's something that you that I'm going too fast or not you're not understanding, please feel free to put in the comment and. I've put some, the slides that I've put together also have different sources. So if you are interested in genuinely seeking them further, or if you're interested in knowing more about a particular topic or a particular case study that, I've, that I'm presenting, feel free to either put it on the comments or, or, or add me on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to share the sources uh, later uh, for further reading. And I'm, like I said, the idea is to help you, help you uh, execute some of these things. And my main aim is not to just hear myself speak, but actually genuinely to be useful uh, to you. So I'm going to kick this off by sharing my screen. Um, you can probably see my screen now. So I've gone through the introduction. I think that that's great. Um, the four main areas of this session today is one is insights into various social media platforms. Um, I've spoken about the case studies that I'm going to talk about, and then towards the end, we'll do Q and A's. So the first thing is, what is dig digital marketing? And I think a lot of the times people get confused when you're talking about digital marketing, you're thinking it's social media marketing, or is it something you do only on websites, or is it like an e-commerce link thing? And the answer to that is that it's fairly straightforward. You know, we don't need to complicate it too much. It's basically a form of marketing through which you advertise to your consumers digitally. That's it. I mean, it's not really uh, too complicated in that sense. And the, the, there are different channels in, in digital marketing when you talk about that. First is social media platforms, there is search engines, there is websites, uh, there is uh, mobile applications, there's emails. So 
in today's uh, session, probably what we're going to do is focus more on the social media side of things, because in terms of theory, because that is the top trending, let's say, um, platforms today, and, and maybe talk a little bit about that. But then when it comes to case studies, I will focus a lot more on content side of things, because I believe content is a very interesting topic for everyone these days. So like I mentioned, it's to advertise your cons uh, customers digitally, and the, the multiple channels of digital marketing I've mentioned already, but the types of digital marketing vary. So you have social media marketing, which is advertising and organic uh, management of social media networks. Then you talk about email marketing, where you're reaching out to your database of consumers, may, which you may have, or maybe you're trying to reach a new form of uh, set of consumers. Then you have pay-per-click, something you would have heard, where you're uh, paying for um, acquiring new customers on Google Ads or social media networks, and then uh, SEO, search engine optimization of how organically can you reach uh, your consumer and how do you uh, build your website, you know, to, to make sure that your SEO is, is spot on and that you're organically gaining this long-term uh, brand equity through the consumers. And finally, it's content marketing, which I think is super critical in today's day because uh, there's content everywhere on every single digital platform uh, that you see. So first thing, um, aside from aside from the the theory, uh, there are quite a few myths, you know, when you when you when you hear digital marketing or social media marketing. I wanted to, and when I was putting the slides together, there's so many things that came to my mind. Uh, there are misconceptions around around that I hear at least, and I thought, why why don't we address them before we you know go into the case studies and rest of the rest of the topic? So one of the myths is that. You might have heard this, you know, as a, like I said, I'm, I might be addressing startups, I might be addressing folks from established companies or MNCs, but this is, this is meant for all. I mean, you would have heard this many times from people saying that you need to use all social media channels where you have to be Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, all of that, but I, not necessarily. A lot depends on the type of audience, audience you're trying to reach. A lot depends on your expansion strategy. Um, to be to be frank, it also depends on the on, on on where you are geographically. You know, because there's some channels that are that are more popular in some regions versus the other. So that is one myth that we should leave behind in 2021. Um, the other one is that social media is a is a is a cost center. You know, you spend a lot of marketing money, and this is typically you hear from, um, I mean, I would say business planning teams or finance teams. But then it does drive a bottom line if you use it properly. You know, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be wasteful. There are ways of targeting and reaching that uh, sales objective that actually adds value to the bottom line. Um, we don't have enough content because if you think of all these different platforms, you know, one might imagine that, oh, I need content every single day to put on all these different platforms. It seems overwhelming. And it seems like this is something you have to put a lot of effort, more importantly, resources and money on. But then there is also something called repurposing content. You know, you might not realize that there is content that you may have shot as an example. I'm from retail, so I'm going to probably use a bit more retail examples in the store last year, which was quite relevant for a particular type of technology or particular type of format of, of uh, let's say, a product. And it did well then. But that same content can be repurposed today when I'm trying to maybe utilize it for, if not the same product, at least that category of products. And I think there's always content if you if you like to look at it that way. Um, email marketing doesn't work. It's it's absolutely, I think <laughs> it's, it's a big myth. We should absolutely leave it behind because email marketing is very successful. Actually, one of the case studies that I will be talking about, the main platform that we used to reach our audiences was email. And that was a more of a B2B case study. So you'll, you'll hear more, a lot more about that. Um, I think you would have seen overwhelming number of hashtags everywhere where you know you're, you're, where you can go and see the top trending hashtags and, and, and then you start putting a lot of them, trying to reach different audiences or the people who follow those hashtags. But you don't need to use a lot of hashtags. You need to use the right hashtags to reach the appropriate audience for sure. But I don't think we need to use a lot of hashtags or for every single post on, on social media. Um, a great site is, is absolutely important because end of the day, um, whether it's a site on, on a desktop or on a mobile platform or it's an app, end of the day, your product or your services or yourself, whatever you're trying to put out there needs to be backed up with a, with a website that is great, but it's not enough. I mean, you can build a great website 
but then that just is not enough. We need the right targeting mechanisms. There needs to be, like I mentioned earlier, when it comes to SEO, it needs to be compatible with, with the search engines to make sure they're organic, you know, reach also. So this is one myth. Uh, and, and, and by the way, this is also linked to the budgets and also linked to a long-term strategy of marketing, not just about building a website and, and things will automatically fly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So digital marketing is for all businesses, all sorts of businesses. And one of the case studies I'm going to talk about is, is how Instagram and Facebook is purposely focused on local businesses and small businesses to make sure they do well. Um, this, is a, this is a good one. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, whenever I, I, this is kind of inspired by my own family, each time we talk about these different, uh, you know, marketing channels, uh, someone in my family who's a bit older might come and say, this is something for new people, it's for the Gen Zs and nobody gets it. I completely want to want to change that mindset. It's got nothing to do with age. It's got to do, it's got everything to do with who your target audience is. What are you trying to convey? What are your brand, uh, I would say, targets that you want to achieve, whether it's sales, whether it's awareness, and there are enough resources and channels that can help you today to, to you know, use these different platforms. <clears throat> Sorry, my screen is frozen. Sorry, my screen is frozen. Shavana, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. The screen is closing, yes. I don't know. Let me just click on the next and then we see. Okay. So one of the myths is, is once you put out the content, uh, uh, it's enough, you know, and it's automatically going to start driving views and, and conversions and sales, but then that's not the case. We're going to be talking about, you might have a great content, but not the right strategy on how to basically publish that content. And I think uh, this is something we should absolutely consider when it comes to putting out that business plan, putting out that marketing plan uh, together for your, for your product or service. So those are the myths. And I think um, once we're out of that, uh, one key thing always remains is your business objectives um, is, is about, and if, and if I want to make it very simple, it's about acquiring new customers. So you go and reach out to customers that are looking at your website and looking at your page, you're looking at your offering. And then how do you drive that engagement and keeping them engaged? So content needs to be exciting. It needs to be relevant. And it also needs to be um, targeted for that particular audience. Um, of course, what we are aiming for is a conversion from that. Um, so that's important. And the long-term loyalty is built on how you are working and and communicating and interacting with your consumer on a daily basis uh, after that. Most importantly, all of this needs to be measurable. And I think, um, and if one of the first points I mentioned, what I really like about digital media and marketing is that it's measurable, it's tangible. You can see your, your, your numbers, you can see the views, you can see how much you spent in, in, in you know, in, in maybe if you're doing a, uh, click a pay-per-click kind of a campaign, you can see your conversions and at the end of the day, you can see the customers have dropped out from your, from your pool also. If I wanna quickly go through social media platforms, I, I don't need to tell anyone what these are. Uh, I, you obviously, obviously know the different uh, level of platforms. So I've only focused the ones that are generally, I feel are interesting um, for businesses. Um, Again, they're super broad. I'm not mentioning TikTok, which is super trending right now in the Middle East, or I'm not talking about Pinterest, which is huge in US. I'm just talking about the main ones uh, that are there today. Uh, obviously, for a wider list, there are enough resources available. This slide actually gives you a good insight on, on uh, what are the active, active users in millions uh, that, you wanna, uh, that you can see on these different platforms. Facebook being obviously the leader in that. And the great thing about Facebook is A, it almost, I would say it almost started the concept of businesses coming on social social platforms and um, creating pages and more importantly having an advertising aspect to it. I think they were very they have very sophisticated uh, um, I would say um, resources available for a new even a new business to come on board and, and try these tools and then make it happen. Of course, YouTube, WhatsApp, Messenger, they're all all great. They all have a certain uh, target YouTube, of course, is more video. WhatsApp has a social networking side of things, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, 
but there are enough platforms available for disposal, let's put it this way. The idea is not to be on all of them, the idea is to be on the most relevant ones and how you can actually um, achieve, your, achieve your targets. Um, before I jump into case studies, I thought it's interesting to maybe talk about some digital marketing trends, which are very relevant. Um, it's, it's kind of um, like a good segue to what I said earlier that I don't want to make it too theoretical. I, I've based it on my study, based it on what I've been reading about recently in my industry and, and, and general industry at, at, at large. So one of the trends I think that, that are very important, um, actually before I go there, and quite a few of these points are very inspired by the recent uh, pandemic and how it has opened up a huge universe of different sorts of marketing strategies and how you basically linking different platforms. So a lot of this is based on based on the recent uh, turn of events in 2020. So omni-channel marketing has become very important where you're looking at, um, where you're looking at, where a consumer rather is looking at different channels for getting the same message or similar message. So you're not really, uh, you can't really say that I'm going to be only doing, I'm going to be doing a separate email and then there's going to be a separate message on my, on my, um, on my social media. And then there's something else happening on my website. I think there's a lot of consistency that is required. And there are some, um, there are some um, insights that I've, that I've, I've collected. And it says that one, one of the big, biggest part of Omnichannel is also influencers. Now you see a huge rise of influencers. And a couple of statistics that I want to read out is that the influencer market industry is, is going to grow approximately to $14 billion in 2021. So this is huge. And 240 new influencer marketing focus agencies have been established after the pandemic. You know, So I think Omnichannel and influencer are quite linked in that sense. And, and you can't um, live one without the other. And I don't want to confuse everyone. Influencer doesn't mean only celebrities. It also means key opinion leaders or key opinion customers that you might have um, in your industry or in your business. Um, Real-time insights for spot on consumer demand. So this is very, uh, I would say it's quite important to understand this, that you, we, can't, we, can't have a, we can't have a marketing campaign and then after the campaign is over, a few months later, we look at it and, and look at the result and then, and then try and ascertain the consumer demand. I think it almost needs to be a two-way street where you're running a campaign or where you're running a marketing, uh, or let's say plan or executing it. You're getting real-time consumer feedback and real-time understanding of consumer demand. Now, the great thing about digital marketing is it actually allows you to do that. And that's why as a business, it's very important to be open to, open to hearing from the consumer also, so it's not just about throwing a product out there or service out there, but it's also receiving feedback. It's also understanding what is the what is a consumer looking for uh, these days, especially in the targeted area that you are. Um, and it's quite quite linked to the last point where customers need connected digital experiences. You know, so it's not um, it's not like you know where where we believe that, uh, that our messaging or our offer that we have put out there is, is something that the consumer expects. And I, I really found this, this particular statistic very interesting, where you're saying that the expectation is that 68% of the consumer expect brand to demonstrate empathy. And the reality is that only 37% say that, that the brands demonstrate empathy. And I, and I love this thing too. And it's a very common practice as business people that we do is that we almost assume what a consumer wants. And I think our messaging, our, 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 our messaging or our offer or what we have to put out there is, 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 is for a consumer who we have built in our own minds. And I think this needs to change because digital media and digital platforms allow you to receive that feedback. And I think understanding what the reality is, is, is very important for you to really deliver the right message. And the second one also is 66% of the customers expect companies to understand the unique needs and expectation where the reality is even lower and much lower. So I think uh, the, the one takeaway from this slide and the previous one that the previous slide that I mentioned is that as a, as a business owner, you could be a startup or a big company. Uh, please be very open uh, to one, receiving feedback from customers, two, understanding what they really need. And three, always knowing what your competition is doing with the same customer and what is the message being passed on to them. And I think once you have understood all three, I think it's a lot easier to, you know, develop your marketing strategy and execution of that strategy. Uh, continuation on, on, the, on the trends, uh, PDC and SEO. Again, I promise I won't use too many jargons. It's just a few. Uh, 
pay-per-click is basically a form of uh, marketing, digital marketing, where you're, as an example, a simple example, if you see on Google, you type something, uh, you might see some ads, which are relevant. As an example, if you're looking for a water bottle online, and you might start seeing some ads from water bottle manufacturing companies, um, each time you click on it, there's a basically Google is charging the brand money for that. And that's pay-per-click. SEO is search engine optimization, which is a more organic way of uh, reaching out to your consumer. Now, this is linked to the website that we spoke about earlier. So this using the same example, I might be a water bottle <laughs> manufacturing company, and I'm using that because there's one in front of me right now, uh, is that I might be uh, using uh, content on my website, which is more uh, organic in nature, is detailed, is communicating the value uh, proposition of the bottle, is communicating the value prop of my brand. And at the same time, it is relevant to what the consumer is looking for. This is a long-term way of, of basically acquiring loyalty and acquiring the customer. So the point here being that it's now time has come where a, where a paid digital campaign can't be too separate from SEO. I think teams need to work in tandem. Um, if SEO leaves somewhere, the PPC needs to take off or vice versa. And this is a very important trend, I think, to look out for not just 21, but, but beyond 21. Um, personalization of content. Um, if, and this is especially important when you're trying to outperform your custom, uh, competition, sorry. And that's the time you wanna personalize the messaging, personalize the content uh, for the target audience. And I have a great case study for that. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it um, later. Um, now, the evolution of, of, of social media, it went from being just a place where you're interacting with folks to uh, companies setting up their pages and interacting with customers to, uh, to, and getting feedback and, and, and complaints in return. But then now it's gone beyond all of that. And it's reached a point where there are enough tools that have integrated on, on social media platforms, which is, um, which is basically shopping. So you have Instagram shopping, you have TikTok. There are many, multiple platforms that have uh, gone into that. And even if you search on Google, again, going back to a simple example, if you search for a product, you might start seeing uh, where it's available on Amazon or on different websites, or maybe the brand website. So the content that you actually put out there nowadays um, on, on these platform need to be relevant for, for, for a shopper also. And this is also helping you convert, um, convert your, you know, your sales quicker. quicker. Um, lastly, on, on the trends, uh, and this is Personally, one of my favorites is video marketing and its importance. Um, this is uh, a great uh, pie chart that you can see that big part of, um, I mean, it's a, this basic question is how do you, what is the most preferred uh, form of, you know, learning about a product? And I think video and obviously concise video, short video, not, not a lengthy one hour video, but a short video is very important uh, to communicate the value proposition. If you might see most of these, most of the content that you see now, whether it's uh, whether it's TikTok, which is again, I keep on using that as an example, or even Instagram coming with Reels, or even WhatsApp having some stories on the top, and all um, social media platforms are going and moving more towards video content because the engagement is very high. And um, the impact of these videos is quite high for a consumer because they explain the value proposition in the most concise manner. Um, I'm not trying to dilute the impact of blogs or anything that is still great and is great for a particular target set of, of businesses and consumer. But then for anything which is more B2C in nature or anything that you need to basically, uh, anything that has multiple aspects to be communicated, I think a video does, does the job extremely well. Um, I think these are the trends. I wanna jump into case studies uh, straight away. Uh, the first case study is actually something that happened in my business. And I love sharing this because um, it is, again, not a theoretical one. I've actually gone through it with my team, and I would love to share it with you. Not just the video, which I will show you in a second, but more importantly, what was the problem and what was the, what was the solution that we went after? So the, this case study is more B2B in nature in terms of marketing. And, um, and what we're trying to combine here is the content side of things and also the channel that we used, which is direct email. Um, and the audience was hardware companies and, and basically startups from outside the Middle East. So basically very short explanation of what we are trying to do as beta is to get brands from outside the region and, and, and launch them in the Middle East that are interesting, that need that sort of an exposure. So we are an all service company that gets in the brand, does marketing for them, logistics, uh, 
uh, uh, solutions when it comes to registration, all of that. It's an all 360 degree service that we give to brands. But can you imagine communicating that to a to a maybe a startup uh, sitting somewhere in one of the states in US who doesn't know much about or at all about beta or doesn't know much about Middle East, doesn't know much about the, the region. And so you're trying to communicate so many different um, messages and define them into one value proposition to that one consumer. And that was a pretty interesting challenge for all of us. Um, what I'm gonna do is maybe show you the video and then uh, we can maybe st stop for a, uh, for some time and then talk about the observation. So it's a two minute something video. So I'm gonna uh, go for it now. Let's start with a rhetorical question. What is beta? Well, it's not the beta you know, like this. It's the beta you'll soon experience in a mall near you, like this. Beta is retail reinvented. It's the new disruptive bricks and mortar experience. It's keeping retail relevant in the digital age. It's designed for discovery, for touch, test, and try before you buy. And now we are in the UAE, the gateway to the Middle East, which means that your products just got introduced to a whole new world of customers. Customers who take to retail therapy, like it's a sport. A region where malls offer bigger and better experiences than anywhere else. Where footfall is always high in the face of the e-commerce boom. Where your products can now sit front and center. Today, as market uncertainty lingers, expansion plans seem costlier and riskier. Logistics and supply chains are forcing major growth strategy rethinks. Beta is evolving to become your solution to international growth. When you launch with Beta, we become you. We share the same passion, excitement, and knowledge of your products and their potential as you. When you launch with Beta, you'll see that our Beta testers, they're so much more than just shop floor sales guys. They're brand experts trained by you. They want to get your tech into the hands of the right customers. When you launch with Beta, it's the full service, online and offline presence, licensing and logistics, distribution and content marketing, all the nitty gritty. It's the stuff we're doing already, and we can do it for you too. And that, that's how we unlock the Middle East. So what is Beta? Beta is connecting you to regions and spaces that offer a bigger bang for buck at the right time. Beta is making shopping for tech like this, this, and this accessible and available to everyone. That's how we do things. Beta, then the rest. So um, thanks for seeing the video and let's let's analyze it from a pure marketing standpoint and a content standpoint. Um, and, and I think if you saw the two minutes, we've not only communicated what's what's in it for them in terms of Middle East. When I say them, I mean, again, the businesses who are sitting out outside the Middle East who don't know much about it and, and predominantly are, are startup, uh, startup companies. Um, so we communicated what's Middle East got to offer for them. We've communicated the retail offline environment, as you saw. There's also a, a good combination of services that are gonna be offered, which are not just offline, but online in nature, access to different platforms. Um, it's got a nice vibe to it. If you see the people uh, or the models that were used, actually half of them are my team. Um, so it just basically shows you uh, a diverse nature of people that are there in the Middle East. Uh, we showed we showed some Emirati customers who are there. So I think these are the, and 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 the tone of of the of the and, and this is this is a very important part for videos and content. The the voiceover that you heard uh, was very relevant uh, for the Middle East consumer. It was it was basically an Arabic um, and American neutral accent that we use. So these are the finer details that you look at. You know, it's not. Each video that you see a brand is putting out there, there's a lot of thought that goes behind it. And, and to, to give you an understanding of what happened with that, we we sent it out to a database of 15, 20,000 uh, startups. Uh, there was a pretty decent conversion of how many reached back out to us. And there was a call to action where you could click on a link and, and basically organize a time for a, for a meeting uh, with one of our sales uh, people. And then they would we would sell the proposition and get into more of it. So it, it was actually very, very successful. We actually not only got brands who signed up, but there's a long-term value, there's a lifetime value of these brands that come on board because then 
it's not only about getting them on board uh, for the project, but then there's so many different upsell and cross-sell opportunities that are available. At the same time, we get to uh, offer that value prop that, that we spoke about. And, and the brands are quite interested because they say, but in the video, you showed us something, what about that? And it's great to see that they're paying attention. Um, and, and a big success factor over there is, is the length of the video also. It can't be too long, it can't be boring. Uh, we need to make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's ticking all these boxes. So I think that's, a, that's a, a one of the case studies that is, uh, like I said, it's, it's very, very current and very from the present uh, company that I work for. Um, second is my favorite tie. And, and, and one of the things that maybe I should have introduced myself earlier, uh, aside from my day job, I'm also uh, in the board of directors for Tie Dubai chapter and, and I support in marketing and uh, and it's, it's a great journey because you, you, you already know the mission of Thai, I, I, I would assume. And I think one of the greatest programs that we have is Thai Women, um, that, that we are, and this, this workshop is a part of that program. But then we also have something coming up in, in December, which is something called Thai Global Summit. It's a huge uh, event of sorts. And, but the idea is not to sell that event right now. I'm not trying to do that. Again, focusing more on the marketing side of things and the content side of things, how we, how we want to position this uh, event. So again, this, is, this was probably uh, one of the trickiest and, and, and the most interesting um, campaign that we ran. And the reason is the audience is so wide. It was for B2B uh, when it comes to, uh, let's say, uh, led to businesses and governments and, and VCs uh, to encourage them to come to Dubai, to come for TGS, Thai Global Summit, um, you know, in December, that is one. But it's also a consumer-facing proposition where you want the consumers to come. When I say consumers, I, I don't, we're not selling anything. What I mean is visitors to come in, uh, residents of Dubai to go for it, uh, visitors who've come from outside Dubai to, to come for it. So it was a very challenging um, task. But then the way we went about it is that as a, as a leadership team, we got together. And I think the first thing you need to address um, in any sort of campaign that you're building, that, and the content doesn't need to be video, it needs to be, it can be anything. It could be a blog, it could be a, it could be a digital, uh, uh, you know, like a photo or whatever image, it can be anything. But then one, one important rule is that a value prop needs to be communicated, the value proposition. And unless you understand the audience of who your audience is, how do you communicate the value prop? So as a leadership team, we got together. So all the audiences that you see on the slide for VC startups, governments, we started listing down all the things that a VC would be looking for in that conference, or what would an individual be looking for in the conference who's got nothing to do with TGS or nothing to do with Dubai, or what will a resident of Dubai be looking for in, in, this, in this event? And what we did is, Try, try putting everything together. So again, bear with me, I'm gonna be playing another video, which is around two minutes long also, where you will see all these different uh, audiences, how we've communicated to them and the value prop. Every entrepreneur's journey begins with a spark, an idea, a vision, a moment of inspiration. This spark drives the world through innovation, leadership, and progress. At Thai Global, we choose to salute this spark in every entrepreneurial journey. As a nonprofit organization, we are devoted to entrepreneurs in all industries, at all stages, from incubation throughout the entrepreneurial life cycle. With more than 15,000 members and 3,000 charter members, Thai Global spans 61 chapters in different cities in over 15 countries worldwide. We help keep the entrepreneurial flame burning. Our passion and dedication inspire others with purity of thought, igniting the creative spark, the fire that burns inside each entrepreneur to cross new frontiers with a sustained will to succeed, with the hunger to build something new. This year, we are lighting the flame of entrepreneurship at Tycon Silicon Valley 2021, a flame that will travel across the globe through all the Thai chapters before finally shining down on its final destination. The Thai Global Summit 2021 in Dubai in December. It's an honor to receive this prestigious award from Thai. Your work is essential to fostering innovation and creating the better world we all want. 
Alongside the world's greatest show is the world's greatest entrepreneurial event. A two-day event with thousands of attendees, world-class speakers, the latest startup pitches, and global investment opportunities that cannot be missed. Thai Global Summit 2021 promises to be the largest flagship event of its kind for entrepreneurs globally. We're happy to light the flame of entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley, the very birthplace of Thai. Thai Global Summit underlines our commitment for global goodwill and resilience. TGS celebrates a real spirit of entrepreneurship in conjunction with World Expo 2020. Send you a warm invitation to join us at Thai Global Summit 2021. Mark your calendars for two days of interactive sessions at the Thai Global Summit in Dubai, a city that was built on entrepreneurship. We look forward to welcoming each of you to the Thai Global Summit 2021. Light the flame of entrepreneurship. Yeah, um, again, again, observing it from a marketing, pure pure marketing standpoint. By the way, feel free to leave your feedback on, on Q&As. Uh, these resources available, like I said, we can share the links with you in case you couldn't hear it properly. Either this one or the previous video, we'll share all the links with you. Uh, you know, feel free to see them again and try and associate with what we are discussing right now with with the video. Um, this was this was, like I said, this was very challenging. But a couple of things you might have observed that we not only spoke about what Thai is um, and what the summit is about, but also what is it that you will get and what is it that you should expect once you're there in the summit and i think whether you're a whether you're a, a individual person who's looking to just network with folks uh, you saw the likes of bill gates coming and giving a speech for Thai, and then and, and that's such a prestigious you know a moment for all of us and from that to also seeing as if you're a startup you also see the possibility of meeting investors or or other kind of VCs, you know, in, in that in that forum. Now, to communicate that and keeping it still relevant is a challenge. Um, but then the idea is we, we we don't just play this video once and and, and let it go and let people, uh, you know, just look at it again and again. But the idea is that what we will be doing going forward is also communicating on each of these individual value propositions on a different platforms. Um, so th this was obviously put on our YouTube channel. We have internally circulated in different countries uh, through our time networks. So gradually, as we go closer to the event, we will also start putting them on different publishing platforms that we have um, as, as Thai. So those are two uh, case studies, which are more video based and which are more personal in nature. Um, there's a couple of ones that I found which are very interesting from the industry. And particularly, I love this topic uh, of augmented reality, anything AR, uh, VR or mixed reality, something very close to me. Um, and obviously, this is general, mostly it is for, for businesses that are more advanced in nature, of course, and you will see them by the case study itself. Um, so one is one is um, Instagram shopping. Uh, so now you can do a virtual makeup. Um, I think this is a this is a, a partnership with L'Oreal, if I'm not wrong. But, um, but th that's not the point. The idea is that that with AR filters, now you're able to do something that you would typically only do on, on a shop floor. And I think this is the great thing about omni-channel experience and retail that you're specifically seeing these days. That and, and a lot of it was inspired and almost driven by the fact that you couldn't go to a store during the pandemic, or you would not want to go to the store and try on a product uh, that is possibly used by others, or you might be scared about contracting the disease. So I think a lot of it is inspired by that, but I think there's a long-term value in, in that, in, the, in, this, in this form of uh, content, in this form of marketing. Uh, so as, as you can see on the slide, uh, you, can, you can look at this lipstick and, and kind of almost look at it how it feels on, on yourself. Um, there's a very uh, detailed explanation of what this is about, the colors and what's available, and also, uh, you can you can just go click on the website and purchase it. So I think this is very interesting, and it's also an expanded form of what we've been talking about, almost with a call to action. That is not just about marketing, but it's also about how can you quickly convert that customer who may or may be interested in your product at that point. So I, I really found this very interesting, um, and I, I can see this increasingly happening 
on, 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 on with many, many businesses. And just to name another one very similar in nature, at least in terms of concept is, uh, is, is Snapchat, they boosted AR. So this is an example of Prada where you could, uh, where you could try on different things. You can try on uh, bags, you can try on clothes, uh, accessories. And again, the idea is same that you wanna uh, see how it looks on you and then go and shop and buy it. Um, I've not put it out here, but then it's an ex extremely interesting one and you should look it up is, is around Ikea. And this is a very relevant one, despite the pandemic. I mean, it's, it's a, if you go to Ikea, it's a pretty in, intense experience where you're buying furniture or any furniture store. It doesn't have to be Ikea, but you're going, you're, you're going there and you're looking for all these different um, couches or beds. And, and then you want to almost think and imagine how they look at, look, look, how would they look in your house? in your environment. So AR makes these kind of, you know, um, experiences possible. The integration is quite, quite smooth and you're able to, to see uh, that product in your living room and vice versa. Once you're in a house, you can see how that product will look there. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to inspire uh, some, some of these case studies. Um, that's it. Oh, sorry, there's one last one. Uh, and, and, and I wanted to specifically put it out there. And this is um, very interesting for local businesses. It's not so much of a case study, it's more about a feature that was added. And, um, and it's, it's great that, that FB and IG, you know, added some additional features for local businesses. To name a few is, is that once you're on, the, on these platforms, you can see which are the businesses nearby and they were proactively promoting those local businesses. The hashtags that were used were more inspired with support small businesses uh, and, and proactively ensuring that you know consumers are, are looking at these businesses also. And the great part about um, FB or, or, or IG or Facebook and Instagram is that you have the chat mechanism also where you can integrate and basically talk to the businesses and, and, and inquire about services. And I think, um, and, and the, the takeaway from this particular case study in my opinion is that local businesses uh, are getting more on the platform and basically it's because there's an intentional effort being done by these uh, social media platforms in particular to get more businesses on board, to get the smaller businesses on board, to make it more easier for them to use these tools, to use the insights to basically uh, put an ad out there. And I would say as a small business, if, if any of the viewers have small businesses, do, do check out these features that Instagram and Facebook have added. Well, this um, completes the formal uh, part of the presentation. I want to start, stop, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because then I can see myself. Okay, perfect. And I can see there are some um, questions that maybe I can, I can address. So there's a, one question, what's an ideal duration for a business video? There's, there's no, um, there's no uh, real answer to that. Uh, the shorter, the better, but the idea is to communicate the entire value proposition, at least from the couple of interactions that you've, or a couple of case studies that you've seen earlier, I felt the one, one, one and a half minute to two minute is a sweet spot if you're talking about a massive campaign like that, where you're not just talking about the product and service, you're talking about geography, you're talking about the industry, you're talking about the product, the service and the value prop. So I think between one and a half, two minutes that we saw the engagement was pretty high. Um, to, uh, for other for other platforms, as you can see, the stories are a lot small, uh, shorter, 30 seconds. So there are quite a few brands that are focusing on a 30 second format to to, to you know put the uh, put the message out there. Um, so the second question that I'm seeing is how can we determine our targeted audience in a reader base other than through Google Form survey and promoting it on social media? I'm not sure if I get this question um, properly, but then I'll just try to read it again. I mean, if I if I'm if I'm reading this and understanding this properly, I don't think you're going to be determined determining your target audience just by looking at a reader base. I mean, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say with this is that maybe if, if your question is, and if I'm assuming this to be the one, 
that how do you understand what your target audience is basically without any sophisticated uh, tools or something, then I think a lot goes back in your product and your value proposition. And I want to go back to everything that I've been talking about, that once you build a product or a service, then you're looking at almost uh, what are the key, key attributes of that product or service, what are the benefits? And then you, there's a lot of research available online or, or, or there's paid research available where you can see who are the target uh, you know, customers for that. And then basically uh, look at what the competition is doing also if, if, it's a, if it's a mature product or a service to define that, uh, define that campaign. Um, there, there's a question about, um, can you tell us some, uh, some more common tools used for digital marketing or there are tons? Um, the, the tons, like I said earlier, in terms of, in terms of just the channels itself, I mean, as, aside from social media platforms that you just spoke about quite a bit, actually, there's a search engine uh, and the search engine optimization comes, uh, plays a big part over there. Uh, your website itself is a, is a, is a tool uh, which should be used widely and it's kind of linked to SEO and anything that you do on kind of a social media possibly can have a call to action back to your website. Uh, that's why it's very important. Mobile applications, uh, I don't need to explain what they are. Everybody's using them all time, all the time. And, and it's extremely engaging. Uh, if you see most of the websites today want you to, um, want you to use the mobile um, application. And email marketing is, is, is again, a very important tool um, that, you can, that you can use. I love this question. The, uh, another question that I see is how how do I choose which specific platform is good for my business? And this is, I honestly don't think there's a, there's a ready recipe, you know, for, for a business type using a particular, uh, particular platform. I think what I can, what I can, exp what I can give you a few examples of, maybe we'll answer this question better. Um, what I've seen is in, at least in the industry I'm from, which is more consumer electronics and more hardware related. Instagram is a great platform because Instagram allows you uh, a lot of content. Um, number one, it aside from the paid marketing inside of things, what what's great about it is that is that it allows you a lot of functionality when it comes to um, videos, it comes to still images or anything you've shot in the store. Um, what worked really well in the past for us as as a brand is is that we were able to use some of the user generated content very well on on Instagram extremely well. We've created our own content, uh, which is like as an example, tried and tested videos and put it on. Instagram reels. Um, so I think, I think if you, if you remember that one slide that I had, the, the five uh, platforms that were mentioned, I would say mostly your business will fit in one of the other for sure. Uh, Facebook is great. If you want to talk about events, if you want to talk about a particular, uh, particular sort of a campaign or a particular promotion of, of sort, uh, Facebook is great on that front. Anything more, obviously video in nature is, is YouTube is great. So my, my, uh, advice would be to, to focus on a focus on a, one platform or a couple of platforms build that build your user base build that engagement uh, a lot of the times you know you hear people say i have x thousand followers and my website my, my platform is great not necessarily you might have a lot of followers but very 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 few engagement very few people who are engaging and i think the target obviously should be more eyeballs but at the same time i think it should be engagement also so try and test with your with your business and your product which are the platforms that are working for you and definitely keep on adapting it but then focus on the content i would say so these are the q and a and then there are quite a few questions that i then i see on the chat give me a second i'll I'm just trying to go and see. Okay, I think the repetition of questions and then, so I'm just reading, sorry, give me a second. So this is a question. It's a it's a pretty lengthy question. So I'm not going to read everything. But uh, um, but what it says is basically that uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs don't have some advanced tools, you know, uh, for video, whether it's 2D, 3D, 
um, VR, AI, these are all expensive options. And, and they wanna, they wanna the, the, the viewer wants to understand what are the options available for, you know, which are more cost effective in nature to build these kind of assets. That's a very, very good point. And if you see the couple of videos that, that, that I played, these are obviously professionally short videos and the AR is, AR functionality is also not cheap. But then, and, and it's kind of linked to the first point, or the, the previous point that I mentioned in terms of engagement, what we have seen as a business or what I have seen in the past, um, of it with some of the communication that we have done is anything which is user generated, anything that was done by our store people or was done by um, done by my team actually got a lot of engagement. And I think this is where platforms like TikTok are doing exceptionally well. This is why uh, stories are doing extremely well on Instagram, where you feel that user generated content is, is, is quite compelling in that sense. So, and they don't cost a lot. All you need is a great smartphone and a camera and video, and there you go. Um, again, the basics of the kind of content still apply, which means what are you communicating? Uh, it needs to be clear uh, in terms of your message. Also, it needs to be relevant for your for your audience. Um, if you want to talk about partnering with these uh, partnering with these companies, there's also some ideas maybe I can um, I can throw out there. Uh, I, I can't guarantee then this will happen, but I can I can I can give you an understanding of how we have done things in the past. There was a product shot. I will not name the brand because it's a quite popular brand. Uh, we wanted to shoot uh, this product in different uh, forms, get some video of it, get some static uh, images and photos of it. Uh, but we didn't have the budget and uh, there was very little budget we didn't have budget for for models we didn't have budget for someone to shoot it so we actually engaged with a community of photographers um, and and we found them we found them to be extremely engaging they were they were micro influencers in, in their own uh, in their own sense and they were brilliant when it came to uh, work so what we uh, what we the way we did it for them is that we were giving access uh, on uh, of the product in a in a in an environment which was very interesting. Let's say it was in the desert in Dubai, and and it was a great artistic uh, let's say challenge for them to come out and shoot those photos and and, and produce this, that content. We got it done for free, and and all we had to do was tag the and and recognize the photographer and and the creator uh, behind that content. So that did exceptionally well for us, and and we used that and repurposed that content for for a long long time. Um, I like Question here on uh, what's the best form of digital marketing if your audience is from different vernacular regions? Oh, right. Uh, yeah, I sorry, I missed that. So, um, visual, anything visual, and anything that you can communicate uh, visually, and 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 uh, as an example, I would say uh, again, there's no right or wrong answer here, but I would say Instagram again is 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 a great tool. Um, where you can actually communicate to different regions um, and you can, and you know, like a big part of, big part of content creation and big part of using the social media is not just about using the products uh, specifications and, and the, the, the technical aspect of things, but it's also the emotional side, which is very important. And this is where you get into content marketing or content creation in de at depth you will understand that actually uh, that that uh, that it's very important to appeal to that emotional side of people so i would say um, yeah i mean it, it all depends on a platform that is allowing you to allowing you to you know express those uh, emotions okay. i is one about the something in the medical field do you see that yeah i'm just going one by one I don't see the medical one. So I'll read it out. Oh yeah, what right. No, I, I saw it. Sorry, Shivana. Yeah. So what about the medical field? What is the best way to present the work by video? A, a lot depends on, on on medical field. I, I as if if you were to talk about medical field as an as an um, I don't know a service or a hospital or a clinic, uh, I've seen a lot of videos actually uh, during the pandemic that were extremely. Uh, informative in terms of how you're supposed to react. Again, I'm using a particular example for a very specific topic right now. Um, but then as an example, one video that I shot from a, from a local, very big uh, hospital and group of clinics that are there in the Middle East, I shot how, I saw how they had shot a video about um, in the ease of using their uh, app or, or website in basically calling them for more information when it came to COVID, when it came to testing, uh, if you're, if you're getting, if you have symptoms, how do you, 
how do you what are the top three things you should do uh, first isolate yourself and all of that it was a very short video again one and a half minute video that that actually conveyed that um, um the convey that so yes so to answer your question directly yes video is a video is a great side of things but then i won't only i won't only uh, stress too much on video if there is a very specific medical field that requires a lot of in-depth research i feel blogs are great uh, blogs are great for that where you're talking about a particular kind of issue or you're talking about a particular kind of service which would be which is relevant for someone maybe who's going through a uh, uh, through through a disease that is very difficult uh, you know so I think I think it all depends on what you what you're trying to what again who's your audience again and who is it that is consuming that content. But then blogs are also great for anything detailed in terms of medical or or deep tech also um, on that on that front. So I'm seeing all the questions. Bala, thank you for all the feedback. It's uh, great. I think there's a there's a similar question, so I'm gonna skip that. How do we? Oh, this is a, this is a very good question. Uh, uh, how do we design a video of a telehealth platform? It's quite dull as a as content. Um, I I don't know if dull is the word. Yeah, I mean yes, the couple of videos that you've seen are are more more engaging and the tempo in those videos is more about future it's about achievement it's about yes so yes it, it will not be a similar video but i think telehealth platform again is, is again a very relevant platform and if i want to go back and i'm probably repeating a couple of things that i said in my previous answer um which is again medical in nature it is quite important that 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 the value prop is communicated which means that if in telehealth if you're trying to communicate a speed of service, or if you're trying to communicate uh, the different languages where you can where you can have this uh, service, you know, uh, with, with, which, with which you can have the service, or if you're trying to maybe talk about what are the kind of uh, issues that you can solve uh, on the phone or or, or or online. I think communication about these particular aspects is very important. So even though the video will have a different um, nature, will have a different type. Uh, but it may be, maybe as an example, I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking while I'm talking, um, instead of making it super visual or instead of having it too many frames in the video, maybe what you need to focus on is a lot of text, uh, talking about the speed, giving some statistics about uh, some, uh, some things or concepts that you have, that you've observed in the business in the past or from the industry, or if you're trying to beat any industry standard, maybe you want to put it out there. So I think that as much facts you're going to put out for a, for a, for an important topic like that, it's going to be it's going to bring more credibility. And it can't be it won't be dull. Like I, I generally feel, uh, if if you, you if you're targeting the right audience who need that sort of a service, I don't think it's going to be dull just because it doesn't have that tempo or just doesn't have that models and the celebrities and 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 backing that up. I just feel it needs to be useful and meaningful for someone to um, use that service. Um, I'm just reading the question. Sorry, it's a pretty long question. So give me a second. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so basically, when the question is when you're offering more than one services, how do you keep the social media messaging consistent? For instance, let's take an NPO that is trying to portray its work, which is in different fields, the projects vary, which results in a non consistent uh, messaging. I think. And this is this is actually a, 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 yeah it's kind of it's kind of a similar thing that I faced that uh, we faced when we were building that uh, time uh, video. Um, so you're right. I think keeping the consistency is very important. Um, let's say you have three or four different social media platforms. Each of the different media platforms has a different type of content that is being used, or or let's say a type of content that is more um, useful. And then a different type of an audience also possibly that is consuming that content on these different platforms. Now you so let's say if you're talking about a, a new product and that is focused on actually let me not use an example because then it then it then it starts getting more complicated. But just extending the thought for that I had earlier, maybe what we need to do is in this situation is that have your value proposition listed out, saying that. 
uh, for a particular audience, as in a college student, my value prop is so and so for this particular product. And let's say a Gen Z uh, or a Gen X or Y, this is a different one. And you kind of almost look at them on on a, on a, on, a, on, a, on all together and see what are the common elements of that particular communication, um, which means that there are some things about your product or service that you uh, that you're going to be communicating to all of them, um, and then you're going to be communicating one over the other when it comes to a particular audience. And that could be a bit separate. But the way you keep consistency is maybe uh, the tone that you use. If it's a video, if it's a still, then the kind of colors you're using, the backgrounds you're using, the environments you're using, uh, there has to be some level of consistency. Or at least there's a common messaging in all of them that is basically talking about uh, talking about that uh, the product. And I think one great example, if I can, if I can give from my past experiences, is a is a smartphone. So in the previous company I used to work for, the smartphone is one of those products that you were launching. It was great for, as an example, education. And there, there was a couple of phones that we had launched, which were great. It had a larger screen. It was uh, at that time we were the large screens were not in fashion, just to, just to clarify. Uh, and so it was a it was a big advantage, you know, to have that phone. We wanted to communicate as a media consumption device for social uh, media. We wanted to communicate it as an education device where you can actually uh, read uh, uh, read and take notes uh, on 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 the, on the phone. It was It was it had a pretty hard, um, let's say, uh, surface and, and, and the protection casing. So we, it was also industrial in nature. So we had positioned the basic specs and the benefits of the phone, but at the same time, the ads were created or the messaging rather was created differently for all these uh, um, and uh, different uh, platforms and different uh, audiences. There's something about how do we create viral loop on social social media platforms? I mean, if you're talking about um, that's a great question. In um, you talk about viral loops and and different media platforms. Now, if you look at uh, Instagram again, and you look at uh, Reels, and you look at how when you're today when you're looking at your content, you kind of see relevant and Actually, I'll take a step back before I answer that. A lot of it actually, and I should have covered it uh, earlier also in one of the examples, a lot of the media that you see online as a consumer or as an audience is dictated by your habits of using uh, social media or using the internet or let's say the entire digital universe, if you look at it that way. So if I'm a kind of, I, I'm interested in cars as an example. So if I'm looking at a lot of cars and, and searching different things of cars, uh, what I realize is that the, not just not just the ads obviously which come as uh, for cars and different services but also the content that i'm seeing now is is linked to someone who's a car enthusiast or basically um someone who's uh basically either trying out a car or racing with a car so coming back to the same point now if you want to viral this out and um i i as an example i follow super car blondie but this is a this is one of my favorite uh, influencers and, and the content they put out there. Uh, what I've seen is anything uh, that is specifically done for a particular target audience, as an example, electronic vehicles, which is a new category of cars that are coming out. Anything that you see that is new in nature, uh, it doesn't need to be only a Tesla that is popular. Anything in EV that is coming out starts trending in that community. So what I'm trying to say is that I was at the one point very intrigued and wanted to understand how is the EV compared to a um, to a traditional car, not just in terms of benefits, but more in terms of performance and in terms of in terms of the, the usability and functionality. More importantly, what I started seeing is that from that moment on, the same video started appearing more often. That is one, but also related content started appearing uh, quite often for me. And I'm assuming on the other side, from an influencer standpoint, this started viraling out in a particular community uh, more more than the other. Um, Wow, that's a tough question for me. What do you think went wrong with HTC in terms of marketing? How did HTC lose its market? Uh, if you don't mind, I would not like to answer that question only because for two reasons. One, I shouldn't be talking about my ex company. And secondly, uh, I, I love my ex company. So I don't want to talk about any failures if, if there was a failure. So I will skip that question just because it's a very specific company that is being mentioned here. 
I think we have some more questions on the Q and A side. Um, I'll just um, give me a second. So I think we're done now. Okay. So there's a question um, when you're offering more than one services. Okay, so we answered that question, sorry. Because there's a repetition, sorry, I apologize. There are questions on both sides that are, so I'm just trying to skim through them. So there's a question. And, and, and I would love to address this uh, question. So uh, there's a question from someone that says, we are into sale of quality pesticide-free fresh produce and grocery products. Is FP or Insta a better platform for digital marketing or, or, or SEO? Um, I don't think there's a clear answer, but I can tell you what is, uh, what is interesting between these platforms and relevant uh, for, for maybe your, uh, your product. By no means am I an expert in fresh produce or grocery products, but I think, and, and I think it's very important to understand digital marketing and SEO and organic. When it comes to the product itself, uh, and, and this is my opinion, which is a quality pesticide-free fresh produce, this is something that is super trending, especially after the awareness uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what you're consuming as a product, as foods, as produced fruits, vegetables, whatever. A, the awareness is very high. Uh, there's a lot of competition in this in this space uh, that I see. Um, so when you talk about any plat, before you talk about any platform, the SEO part that you mentioned in your question is super important. Um, which means the website or the app or website. I'm sure there's a hosting website in that how much of content are you keeping uh, on updating on that i mean are you are you talking about the benefits of having fresh produce are you talking a lot about case studies maybe maybe one of your customers have used uh, this thing or maybe it's a b2b customer who, who started using it in a restaurant as an example when you start putting these um, right words and the correct words over there on your website and that's how you start getting organic uh, hits on your website uh, which, in my opinion, lead to long-term loyalty. It's it's great, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, paid marketing, of course, you can always push it with with content. So FB, um, if you want my take on between FB or Insta, FB would be interesting if you're hosting, let's say, a, a fresh produced day, and in one of your stores or one of your I don't know if you have a store, but uh, one of uh, let's say a physical event, I would use FB definitely for sure because I think the reach is very high. Uh, the the way the platform is structured, events are events are great. It's almost like a calendar. I use FB very, I mean, almost every day for looking at what's what's trending in my interest areas, um, and and even even work wise, even career wise, I see a lot of things there. So FB for more for that. Insta maybe I think would be great if you wanna talk about a particular type of a product and you wanna talk about the benefits of it. If it's a video format content, I would maybe go for for Instagram. But again, I won't repeat myself what I said earlier for one of the answers. Try and test, you know, keep on keep on trying different platforms, try, keep on trying different content and the and the and and, and your engagement levels uh, and your conversion levels are gonna basically dictate what you what you kind of evolve to in the in the next you know campaign. Um, okay, I'm scrolling down. I think. I think I've answered all of them. There's one come up on the chat, Ramit, just now. I see. Is that? Uh, no. Um, I have a question for you, Ramit. In terms sure. of the. Can I ask a question? Sure, please. So I have a question about budgeting for social media or budgeting for digital marketing. So, should one, like you talked a lot about the different omni channels and the different. Uh, you know, avenues that you can um, work uh, for, for digital marketing, should one plan the budget and if, and then decide or should one sort of decide, okay, this is what I want to do and then put a budget towards it. And at what percent kind of, how does one decide on what to spend at the start, at the outset? Yeah. Um, 
if you don't mind, I'm going to take a slightly lengthy approach in answering that because I think it's important to understand uh, not just the journey of, of spend and planning and budgeting, but I think it's also important to understand um, your customer and the lifetime value, as you say, LTV of a customer. If you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to attract and gain a customer, uh, then it's not only about that particular transaction or that one transaction. Just for the ease of understanding this, I think I'll just use a, con a consumer product. Let's say any consumer product bought by a consumer, um, end consumer. So it's not only more than one transaction, but then what brands are, are trying to do and, and companies are trying to do is to see that how can you keep all that engagement um, for a long, long time where you want this consumer to come and have repeat purchases, one. Secondly, also recommend you and your product and your interface for shopping in the future. Now, if you're talking about this level of um, uh, I would say engagement because it's not uh, because you need uh, se separate tools also and, and a strategy also to how to keep that engagement. Maybe one of them could be loyalty program. But uh, the reason I'm telling you all this is then when you're looking at that sort of uh, engagement and that sort of a customer and lifetime value of a customer, then the budget needs to be separate from a campaign where you are doing it purely for awareness. Maybe you're a new brand that is launched in the region. Um, nobody knows your product and maybe the primary purpose of your of your of your campaign is just awareness mass awareness in in the, in the country that you're not really specifically doing it for an e-com you're not directly maybe targeting and asking them to convert or buy if they do that's great but if you're trying then there's a separate budget that goes behind it so i think it all depends on your strategy of what you're trying to accomplish um the great thing about what you asked is that most of the if not all of the platforms that i've spoken about today whether it's instagram shopping or whether it's uh, TikTok, whether it's uh, Google Ads uh, through uh, through paid uh, paid search, uh, if, if you're talking about bidding on keywords, if you're talking about running campaigns which are Google Display on the Google Display network, all of them have uh, pro uh, real time insights, real time um, mechanisms for you to see engagement with your ad, and for most of them, what you can do is set a daily budget. So. One thing we have done recently, and I'm going to use, I like using real, real life examples to build more context. One thing we had done uh, recently with the product that we launched, we weren't very sure about whether it's going to be really successful. It is a pretty niche kind of product. We started off with a smaller budget on a daily basis and started almost monitoring the engagement, the views, the uh, engagement, the conversion, if it needed uh, for us to change the content, we did it. Uh, but then in a couple of weeks, you almost start realizing if this is something that is working for you. So what we did, and it did work for us, luckily. So we doubled the budget, tripled the budget immediately, and then started seeing more results. So um, these are the three points I wanted to mention. But the first point that you asked earlier was uh, whether you should plan the budget first or you should spend budgeting. I don't think there's a real answer. It depends on your objective. If you're a large multinational company doing awareness, they usually budgets assigned for a project. I think uh, the marketing manager, the marketing team divided based on different objectives. So a certain budget is put for awareness, certain is put for a PR, something is put for digital marketing, and then you spend it all. But then I think uh, if you talk specifically about e-com led transactions or e-com led campaigns, then I think this is where you need to understand the unit economics of if your product is worth X, what percentage of that X are you willing to invest in, in marketing? So you start with that and you see if you need to spend more. Okay, great. Um, and then in, to lead on from that, do you think this should be done in-house or um, should be, you know, given out um, to, 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 you know, yeah. It, it, it depends. But then even if you're giving it out, even if you're out, when you say giving out, I'm assuming you mean to an agency or an outsourcing to an agency. Yes. I, yes. Even if you're giving out to an agency, it's extremely important for you to understand uh, what is it that you're asking the agency to do. Um, the, the reason to get an agency or outsourcing your work should not be um, that we don't understand this particular problem or we don't understand this particular channel, so we give it out. Not It shouldn't only be that. I generally feel, as a, and this mostly applies to startups and entrepreneurs who are really, uh, you know, or, or bootstrapping the companies who are really, really trying to, to utilize the dollar effectively. It's extremely important for you to understand these different platforms. My advice would be don't spend on a platform if you don't understand it, if you don't understand the benefit of it. Um, if you were talking about any expertise which you need in a certain uh, geography, which you're not used to, 
Uh, again, as an example, beta, if you remember one of the things that we offer to our brands is, is marketing uh, services also. Now for a, someone sitting in, as an example in Texas, now if you ask them to develop a marketing campaign targeting Emirati youth, as an example in Dubai, it's gonna be challenging. They need to outsource it to us who understand that. So there are different key use cases where you do definitely outsource, but in irrespective of whether you outsource or not, I genuinely encourage everybody to understand at least the basic principles of, of marketing and digital marketing in particular uh, before, you, before you put your money and put your budget behind it. Right, and there's one more question coming, I think. I it kind of yeah um there's a what percentage of profits should a startup allow to digital marketing if honestly i could answer that for the specific number all the finance managers in the world would thank me but uh, but there's there's no there's no uh, right answer to it again unfortunately i'm sorry because a lot depends on, on, again, your objective. It depends on how much profit are you talking about? Are you, what stage is your company in? Um, what, uh, what I can tell you is uh, that what, what, we try and, what we try and do is, uh, is not so much from the profit, but what we try and do with our partners is keep between two to 5%, and especially if it's a new product launch, if it's a new uh, product that is coming in for the first time as a start. Um, and we plan that out in the, in the first couple of months and see how it goes. But again, there's no right or wrong answer. We do it in a certain way just because it, it works for us. And then we scale up the budget based on our objective. Um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. I don't think there's any more questions now for me. Okay, I think we're pretty much on time then. Um, then I would so this uh yeah sorry go ahead Shama. Would like to add anything close on anything I, i've spoken a lot so i don't want to repeat myself but then uh, i think i think the only thing i would love to add is is uh it's, and this is especially focused on 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 the startup community and if there are listeners and attendees from the startup community i would really encourage them to utilize the resources that are available online uh, you know, I think it's a myth, and I think I should have added it in the list of myths that that was there. Uh, that digital learning, digital marketing is expensive and it's complicated. You need to go to a top shot university to learn it. Although yes, there are enough programs on, in these places, but I think there are so many free resources available online uh, on YouTube. I mean, you can learn pretty much everything about Google AdWords on on YouTube and on Google, and uh, and you can see uh, learn it step by step. It's actually a, a uh, actually, it's a course of sorts where you where you go through it in, in multiple days and weeks. So I would genuinely encourage founders to to learn about this. It's not going away anywhere. Uh, digital marketing, uh, utilization of social media platforms, utilizing SEO, paid clicks. It's not going anywhere. And I think it's very important before you start spending a marketing dollar uh, and outsourcing it or or even just trying it on your own, I would highly encourage you to spend a few hours and then go through these different courses, uh, which are available for free on uh, online. And that's Ravi. it. Thank you very much. And giving for giving me this. Uh, thank you for having me on on this uh, workshop and helping me contribute. Ramit, thank you very much. That was inspirational, very informa information laden, and um, thank you for coming on our channel. And for the participants, we're taking a break. The Active Learning Workshop will be back in January. Hope you enjoyed the three sessions. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, so everyone. Much, Bye. Thanks, Ramit. Uh, our event page information is available on chat. Please go to our events page on the Thai Women website and you can access all the information. And once again, thank you so much, Ramit, for taking out the time and uh, providing these valuable insights to our participants. My pleasure. Thank you.